Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mohsen and Fauzia Jaffer Center um, for Muslim World Studies uh, documentary, um, documenting the history and vision of Florida's oldest Muslim community. Um, on behalf of uh, Florida International University, um, the Department of Religious Studies, Western Indian Ocean Studies, and FIU Office of Engagement, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you join us today. The, we'll have three panelists, um, distinguished sort of scholars uh, on the community. Uh, Professor Afra Hameen, uh, Dr. Afra Hameen, um, who is a longtime community member and one of the pioneers of the community. Um, she is leading the project uh, and she will be talking about that process with us. Professor Carlos Grenier in the Department of Religious Studies, who is also working on the project and documenting it um, in the academic study of Islam. And uh, Mr. Abdul Halim Mohsen, uh, who is the owner of EAM Productions, and he is the one who is working with us to document in the best quality possible um, these very important lives and stories. So we're very honored and grateful to have all three of them uh, here with us today, as well as all of the people at FIU who have uh, helped to make this happen. So I just wanted to um, very briefly talk about the importance and the significance of the project. Um, and that's part of what everyone else is gonna do in their own perspective and their own words. Um, just to give you kind of an idea of how the project developed, um, I live here in Brownsville and I've uh, been connected with um, Imam Nasser, who is the uh, Imam of uh, Mashhad Lansar. Uh, we've connected uh, over the last couple of years. We work together on many different projects. We also support the Claire Muhammad School, our, our foundation, the East West Foundation. Um, and over time, we've, you know, one of the things that's very important for us is to be able to understand the community that we live in. Um, and I saw many similarities between the community in Miami and the community that I grew up in, uh, in Slido, Louisiana, um, the Mashal Islam uh, community, which was also headed um, by an individual that was part of the Black Muslim community as well, the Imam, uh, Imam Lawrence Abdul Haq. And some of the things that I've learned, I think, just growing up and understanding, I saw mirrored here in Miami, and I thought that it's just a very important time to document and to understand the significance of the community. Because one of the things that we see here um, now is you have sort of Cosmos, which is this coalition of Muslim uh, organizations here in South Florida. You have many different Muslim organizations, but the foundation, the bedrock, the people who helped to create the space within which uh, later Muslims were able to fill and occupy and expand was done by the, the Black Muslim community. And I think to them, we owe a great debt um, as a society because they also help to force in a way and also spur uh, white Americans uh, to think about the legacy of segregation and the impact uh, that segregation and slavery had had on uh, the Black community. And so that's why I am so inspired every time we listen to the stories of the communities that we're, the, the pioneers that we're, that we're working with in Mashallah and Sara, because they help to define and create a space in a society that was, you know, the uh, ideal of what it meant to be an American was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant at that point, right? And so they actually created this, helped to create the space along with uh, Black Christians and sort of other groups as well um, to create a space. And I think that that's one thing. I think the second thing that it does is that it uh, the Black Muslim community really helped to create a, a dialogue within Christianity itself. And I think that's another thing that's very important is that you had, uh, to be fair, quite a majority of Americans um, that were quite okay with how things were going in the status quo of American society. And the idea that another religion could fundamentally um, be an answer to the challenges uh, that Black Americans had to face, I think was a huge contribution, the idea of self-sufficiency. There are many of these amazing things that my panelists, uh, you know, the panelists will talk about. Um, but I think that that's something that's very important and particularly the foundations again for um, the, 
the establishment of essentially multiculturalism in Miami. And this is one of the, another group that's very important that even precedes the coming of the Cubans and sort of other groups into Miami at a time when Miami was black and white. Um, again, pushing the narrative and saying, look, what it means to be an American can be of a different religion and of a different race. And that's also part of the American experience and documenting that. So I feel that this project that we're doing is vital because the community played such an important role in the development of black consciousness and many you know we have succeeding generations of black americans are indebted to the work um, of the community and people that are associated with the community like uh muhammad ali um yeah the honorable elijah muhammad uh, malcolm x many of these people helped to pave the way for the diverse society that we have today so with that, um, I just wanted to say, you know, a thank you to everyone that's attending, who's watching this, to um, our core group um, that's doing the hard work of um, listening, recording, um, and we hope that the fruition of this will be a exhibition on the history of, of the community. Um, we hope to launch, launch that uh, on the Juneteenth weekend. So it's an honor and a pleasure to have you all here joining us. Um, and with that, I would like to um, defer to our first panelist, Dr. Uh, Afra Hamim. So I will spotlight her on this. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal Akhtar. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. I represent Masjid Al Ansar in this effort because of the importance that it shows for America, Black America, and yes, the Liberty City community. You know, this project has shown or has highlighted the importance of recognizing religion as a way of life. Although we may not have practiced Al-Islam in its authenticity, when you look at the components of what our community had during the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you will find that yes, we were living the religion, various components. Al-Islam is known as what? The complete way of life. And that's what happened under the nation of Islam. The stories that were told shared how the religious community conducted its home life, its um, children's lives, the women lives, the men lives. It showed how we learned to cook, how we didn't eat out, we didn't trust certain foods. All of those stories will come out when you view the documentary. So with that being said, I really sat there and listened to the stories that were told and it was like a flashback for me. For Abdul Halim, he was a young child when I first met, I remember him being born. So it is an honor to have him being a part of this documentary because he gets to relive what his, fa his father lived and he has a hands-on uh, view of it now. I think that we will be surprised at what we learn in these stories. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, as Dr. Afra um, briefly gave an explanation, my name is Abdul Halim Muksin. I am the owner of EAM Productions and um, the lead director on, on this documentary. Um, sorry, I didn't really have anything prepared. I figured it'd be just best if I spoke from the heart, but um, in being involved with this project, as you know, as Dr. Afra mentioned, um, I was, I am a product of Master Don and Sar and its community. As a kid, uh, I never really understood the significance of, of the environment I was in, being that I was so young and, and, and not experienced in the world around me. But um, I did understand that, one, the sense of family um, and community and, 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 and uh being unified in, in 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 uniformity it's all it all has been something that was undeniable um even if i didn't fully understand it as a child it was definitely um 
it was definitely something that I would say was like the cornerstone piece in my upbringing um, throughout Islam and, is, and eventually in my adulthood. Um, so far, it has been um, uh, a, a reliving uh, tale, so to speak. Um, certain memories come back to mind of me running around the mosque and um, doing family talims and, and the masala and 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 really just taking in um, kutbas from various um, imams. And, 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 and to be a part of it all has really been a blessing. Um, so far, I am surprised because I never would have thought um, I'd be in this position that I am in, uh, actually documenting the history and telling the story of National and SAR and its impact on the community. Um, but I would, I would have to say that it really is a blessing and um, I'm thankful to be a part of it. Uh, and with that, I will refer to our next panelist. Um, thank you, Dr. Akhtar, for having me um, on here. Thank you, FIU. Um, and this has been very lovely so far. Thank you so much. Thank so, you so much. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Carlos Grenier, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies. Um, and he is a scholar of Islam, and he uh, particularly sort of Ottoman Islam, but he also has a deep interest in Florida and uh, is also a native of Florida as well in Miami. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Grenier. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, to all of you attending and um, to our wonderful co-panelists. Um, I'd also like to, to thank the community of Master al Ansar. Um, it's a very special place. I don't, I don't know how many of you who are listening have had a chance to, um, to see the building located on the on corner of Northwest 7th Ave and um, Northwest 50, 53rd Street. Um, but it's a place where you can feel many layers of history and many layers of community that have, um, th that have maintained a really independent and clear and strong identity since the 1960s. And it's really remarkable to find such an institution um, in the city of Miami or really in the United States in general, um, something so enduring and so strong and so cohesive. Um, it's been important to me personally. Um, it's been one of the communities that I have found uh, most welcoming uh, in my journey into Islam. And um, I'm really then really honored to uh, to be able to learn more about its history and to hear the, the voices of the people who have um, who have played a role in it over the years. Um, we heard Dr. Hamin um, mention about how uh, religion creates people, right? People do not simply invent religion, but religion um, creates a way of life and creates a, a mentality in, in, in human beings. And I see that um, incredibly strongly in the Masri al Ansar community. Um, since 1966, when it was founded as uh, Mosque Number 29 uh, by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, the community has uh, transformed lives. Um, I've seen this in the course of the many interviews that we've conducted. Um, people who came from maybe rural backgrounds or maybe sometimes impoverished backgrounds in the 1950s and, and 60s, um, finding the chance in Master Al Ansar to create um, to, to create a community that is self-sufficient and is directed towards um, self-actualization. This is one thing I see over and over again in, in these interviews, uh, how the principles of Islam would stress, um, you know, the independence of one's own soul underneath God under, as, as a created being. Um, this seems to have um, created an ethics within the Masjid al Ansar community, uh, which is, which values self-sufficiency, um, personal, just personal interchange exchanges, um, a kind of, uh, a kind of sense of duty and honor. Um, and it's, I think what is to me most moving about the community and in this history is that it is able to make good on these promises that religion may offer. Um, not all religious communities, you know, can do this as successfully, I think, as, as Master Al Ansar has done. Um, so we've seen this history um, of people finding their identity and their selfhood through the Master Al Ansar community all the way since the 1960s, all the way up to today. Um, so 
that's something I think truly remarkable. I think um, aside from you know the successes it has had in transforming lives and creating community, I also think it's quite important to recognize uh, the role of, of Master Yala Ansar in particular and Black American Islam in general um, within both the history of Islam in, in the United States and United States more generally. Um, this community is the oldest Muslim community in Florida, as, um, as Dr. Akhtar mentioned. It was the original mosque of South Florida and thus provided a, a kind of foundation for all of the other Muslim groups that were to come into, into the region. Um, you know, we've heard stories about how various immigrant Muslim groups um, would find refuge in Master al and were able to pray there and 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 find and, and kind of nourish their own Islam within within South Florida, in within the walls of that of, of the mosque. So it's it's at the bedrock of South Florida Islam. Um, it's also important within the history of um, American religion more generally. Um, Black American Islam is one of the most vital forms of American religiosity. Um, we've seen it play a key role in things like the 1960s civil rights movement and, and beyond. Um, in particular, Master Yal Ansar is associated with directly with several world famous individuals, particularly Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, who were strongly associated with the mosque um, in the early days. So we see um, the way the mosque figures into larger currents of American politics and American culture. Um, I think that might be all I have to say at the moment, um, but I think um, with this foundation, all of us have offered comments, um, maybe we can you know, begin to receive some, some Q and A's. Absolutely, yeah, we can do quick Q and A's. I think before we get to the questions and answers, um, I have a few questions also. Um, I think first for uh, Dr. Afra Hameen. Um, I guess one of the, the bigger questions, I think, for maybe people who are not familiar with the Mashal Ansar community would be, um, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, people like uh, Martin Luther King, for instance, right, in terms of his contributions. Um, what is the larger contribution, I guess you could say, of the Black Muslim community to Miami or to America as a whole? What, what is something that you feel is something that hasn't been written in the history books yet that school sh children should learn? So when we get through Black History Month every year, we learn about Rosa Parks, we learn about uh, uh, Martin Luther King, who else should we learn about? Wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> there are several, um, we could say believers of our community that have been skipped over as far as history is concerned. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's wife, Sister Clara Muhammad, actually started the first home school. That was done in an effort to protect the lives and the messages that the children received. And it was done in Chicago. And of course, as that became more successful, the home school of the University of Islam spread throughout the United States. She has not been given her fair story, in my opinion. Education is important to us as Muslims. And I think that we need to highlight or spotlight her contributions. She did not back down, even when the law enforcers came to say, you cannot homeschool your children. She said, over my dead body and she did not back down. And from that, we have grown into what is now called the Clara Muhammad School System. And in Atlanta, we also have what is called the W.D. Muhammad Schools because they have an uh, um, early learning program, a high school, as well as an elementary program. So they have a, a larger um, emphasis on education than we do here locally. Milwaukee has the same thing. Another, um, person that I think has been overlooked is Imam Muhammad's brothers, who were the backbone of Muhammad Ali, as far as his business, Herbert Muhammad, I think we say Jabber. He was the backbone for Muhammad Ali's business enterprises. 
he was asked to help him so that what? He would not lose his money, would not lose his focus. People would not prey on him. Another person that I think, um, another group of people that I think are important as far as the history are the companions of, we say, Imam W.G. Muhammad. Growing up, there was a core group of them. Darnell Kareem and Imam Muhammad's sisters, Aisha uh, Muhammad, who's the editor of the, um, the Muslim Journal. Several people were there in the, as you say, bedrock. They were there in the ground doing what needed to be done. We were blessed that Imam Nasser Ahmed was asked to come to Miami as we transformed a transition into proper Al-Islam. He has his roots in the upbringing of the Chicago Muslim community. And what a difference it made for us because he was very knowledgeable and he helped to turn our community around 360 degrees. So there are many people that we don't hear about that were right there at the forefront. Now, for instance, Dr. Naeem Akbar, who I met when I was in college at Spelman, he was a professor of psychology at Morehouse College. He was very instrumental in having and helping a lot of us who are college students understand the movement of the nation of Islam. Someone like him was very important because guess what? Your college students were there and they were being influenced by the nation of Islam. When I was in Atlanta in college, the brothers were all over the place selling their Muhammad speaks. And I kept trying to figure out what were they doing? What were they about? And they piqued my interest because I wanted to know more about them. Eventually, I would find myself sitting in Dr. Naeem Akbar's psychology class, although I wasn't his student, and I wanted to know what was going on. So that's just to name a few people that I can think of that have not been spotlighted, as, has not, have not been given the spotlight, excuse me, for their contribution to the Black community's contribution to Al-Islam. Dr. Akhtar, turn it back over to you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hamin. I, I have another question for you. Um, okay. Because you're one of the, our, our elders in the community um, and a pioneer <laughs> of the community. I think one of the other questions I think I, that I think you would be great for Americans more generally to understand is when we say Nation of Islam nowadays, there's generally a very negative connotation, and particularly with uh, Minister Farrakhan. Um, and that's kind of how the nation of Islam is understood in the minds of the majority of Americans, I should say. Can you guide us and give us your perspective on the history of the nation of Islam and what that movement meant um, and, and why that, that spoke to you at that point? My, actually, my study of Al-Islam started when I was about 16 years old. I had a neighbor who was known as Captain Lloyd. I would watch him and his family. The children were always very clean. They didn't play with the rest of us, but I would take notice of what was going on. And I would also patronize him by buying his jewelry, his incense, those kinds of things. So, you know, um, what I think America does not realize is that we were a movement. Just like you had the civil rights, the Nation of Islam was a movement. So. The things that were emphasized, of course, as Abdul pointed out, was family life. During the time of the 1960s, there was very little emphasis or support for the Black family outside of each other. You had the civil rights movement that was just starting to grow, starting to take hold, starting to get, go, go forward. And the Nation of Islam kind of distanced itself from that movement in the very beginning because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad felt that we had to be independent. It was important for the members of the community at that time to raise themselves up. And that's an expression that you might hear some people say. Raise themselves up. Remember, African-Americans during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s were considered less than a human person. So it was important that the Nation of Islam's emphasis be placed on what? Helping people improve upon their lives, helping them to feel secure in themselves and helping them to show how they can contribute to this country, although we were separate. And what I 
got and take away from that is that sometimes religion is not necessarily the message of the scripture all the time, but it is the message of how you become a human being contributing to the society in which you live. You know, the community had its own businesses. Our garments were made by our members. We wore our own uniforms. The brothers would um, go out and sell their papers, which was one way of doing what? We called it fishing, but actually it was a form of dawa. Also, we had our own fish, fishing business. The community would um, bring in fish from across Africa. And that was one way of helping us to become what? self sustaining So, you know, it, it, the, it, it actually the nation of Islam can be seen in a negative light by those who do not delve and pull back the layers. All they see is the negative hatred talk that they thought it was, but we didn't think it was at that time because we needed to hear the message to the black man. We needed that message to bring us forward, to make us feel good about ourselves, to make us know that we do have a, um, a contri contribution to make to America. Now, when Imam W.D. Muhammad became the Imam for our community, we transitioned from the Nation of Islam. Farrakhan decided after a, few, a while that he wanted to return to that way of life. We never criticized him. We never said anything negative about him. Imam Muhammad always cautioned our community to be careful of what you say. And remember, we came from that. So how are you going to criticize yourself and criticize others? We hope that inshallah, one day they will become contributing members of the world community of Al-Islam. Now, some of them join us on Fridays for Juma. So they're gradually taking those steps to learn more about the religion. But we have to remember that everything has a place for everybody. And there may be people who need that message to make them feel better about themselves and bring themselves up. I'm not saying that it's not necessary because who am I to judge what they need in their lives? Dr. Akhtar? Thank you so much, Dr. Hameen. That's a wonderful um, perspective. I think it's a very important one that we hear that. I want to now turn to um, Mr. Abdul Halim Mohsen. Um, and I want to just kind of get a little bit of a sense of your own identity. What does it mean to be Muslim and to be part of the Ansar community? Um, and particularly, I mean, you've grown up, I'm sure, you know, in the aftermath of. Um, September 11th in America, you've grown up, you know, in many different, you know, America has gone through a lot in, in your lifetime. Um, what does that mean to you? Um, and, and how do you, what does it mean to be part of the community and to be and to be a Muslim in America? Uh, thank you, Dr. Akhtar, for the question. Um, wow, what does it mean to be a Muslim in America in this day and age, for me at least? Uh, to be honest, quite frankly, I can think of one word and that's survivor. Um, and the reason why I say that is because like you mentioned, um, I lived through that um, experience as far as, you know, the whole 9-11 and understanding um, that uh, <laughs> the, the, the tide has essentially shifted. The world is changing for Muslims in America um, I was still very young. I do remember being in the um, upstairs classrooms in the Musalla uh, area at Masjid Al Ansar, and we had like a small television in our in our in our classroom for like educational videos and stuff like that. But specifically for that day, we were tuned into the news. Um, I remember my my teacher at the time, Sister Kai. She was panicking because of a family member. I, if I'm not mistaken, she, she might have had um, working in one of the buildings that was impacted by the the plane crash. Um, it was it was a very a very now that I think about it, very high emotion, intense uh, scenario in which um, I had no idea what was going to pan out from then on. But then growing up and noticing the shift in the dynamics um when it came to muslims in america um we had extra security around masjid al-ansar at the time because we were afraid that you know 
people may try to either loot or, you know, just do something um, outrageous within the Muslim, Black Muslim community and Muslim community as a whole. So, you know, we amped up security. Of course, you know, we had school, uh, Claire Muhammad School. So we had children um, predominantly at the mosque during the daytime. So that was one of the main concerns was protecting our youth. Um, it was it was very interesting to see because not only did questions come about as far as um, what is Islam, um, are all Muslims terrorists and stuff like that, it was also like a mix, right? Like there was people who were afraid and then there was people who wanted to know more. So it was like a blessing and a curse, so to speak, because it was like granted the tragedy that happened to Americans and the American culture as a whole, it was very, very drastic and, and one in which, you know, changed the tide of history for us. But in the same sense, it allowed for a certain interest to peak within Islam and also within uh, Muslims of the black community, because I remember um, especially during the, the khutbahs given at the time by um, various imams, one of them being, of course, um, Dr. Imam Nasser, um, promoting the true values of Islam and 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 talking about um, its its concept as being a way of life, a peaceful religion, um, one that does not force um, anyone to become a part. Of, of, of Islam or in this community so far. It's just, it's one that is inclusive uh, to everyone and it's very welcoming and warm. And it's not fear, it's not, it's not Islamophobia, which is one of the terms that arised after 9-11. And it's not uh, a religion that that is filled with jihadists. Like, no, that is not the case. So I, I feel like out of the ashes that was 9-11, um, a new flower sprouted and, and, and essentially the idea of Islam was sort of reborn, um, but only to those who were really willing to listen and seek out the truth rather than follow various propaganda. Um, but I know for me, um, as a Muslim in this day and age, uh, I, feel, I feel like I said, like a survivor because I have been approached People have asked me questions all the time. I always have to, as of late, had to make the distinction between Islam being a religion and not a culture. Uh, a lot of times people have that misconstrued. Um, and and I always, always go back to my roots, go back to the community I was brought up in. And, and I really am thankful for it because it's kept me grounded. It's kept me strong and, and I haven't wavered uh, in, in the sense of, you know, all the pandemonium that was caused um, by 9-11. And to be honest, what we still sort of face today in this day and age, um, Dr. Akhtar, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that. It was a very beautiful description, I think, of the very difficult circumstances that American Muslims had to go through, you know. Um, I wanna uh, just uh, lastly, before we get to the question and answers, um, I wanted to ask Professor Grenier about the study of Islam and kind of, if you can kind of just give us a sense of where the study of Islam and the American Muslim communities is right now. Um, and kind of how do we place this project within that, that academic study? Um, because I, one of the, you know, the, the things that um, Mr. Muslim was talking about also was that 9-11 spurred, um, the development of the field of Islamic studies in America, in the West, um, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, so with that, we had, you know, um, I don't know, I mean, just, I would say, you know, you know, 50 or 60 different programs that, you know, opened up all across the United States. Um, yeah. They started now uh, introducing the study of Islam and, and Muslims. Um, so I think that, you know, in the current study of Islam. I mean, how would we place the study, the the history and the story of um, what Abdul Halim Mohsen, uh, Dr. Afrahamin, what they're talking about in their experiences? 
Thank you. Um, that's a really fascinating question. Um, um, like uh, Abdul Halim Mohsen just mentioned, um, Islam is a religion, right? It's not simply a culture. It has many different cultural expressions, though, all around the world. Um, you know, we have Chinese Islam, we have Indian Islam, we have um, Islam in the Middle East. And now we have to recognize that we also have Islam in America. It's a, it's a, it's a younger form of Islam in, in the sense that um, it's a younger cultural form in the sense that it only you know, stretches back a, a limited amount of time, but it is an American form of Islam. And it's an adaptation of Islam to the conditions of American realities, to American vocabularies, um, to American memory. And um, it presents to people a, a, a way of solving American problems. Um, we've seen the the situation, uh, the conditions that that gave rise to the nation of Islam in the in the middle of the 20th century, um, and that it's continued to remain to, to remain relevant. So I think we have to think of um, communities like Masjid Al Ansar as representing a very authentic American form of Islam, um, and then to put it into uh, the framework of global Islam with different expressions all around the world. Um, I think. Um, the study of American Islam and Black American Islam in particular is, is still young. Um, and I think one thing that still needs to be done is to uh, write about it and discuss it in ways that emphasize the local nature of communities, right? It's not simply um, a, um, a single entity across the United States where everything is alike. No, each, each local mosque and each community has um, has its own history. And I think those have yet to be written. Um, and I think that's what our project is trying to do. All right, thank you so much, Professor Grenier. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. I think just the, the democratic nature of the community that it's sort of the way that it's organized locally and then also the embeddedness. And that's something that, you know, we talk about, we love going to uh, the, you know, seeing uh, Imam Nasser and his khutbahs on Friday um, because they're quite remarkable and they're they're very much embedded within um, the culture and the society and the language of America in ways that all other mosques, the I would say all of the other forms of Islam that exist are in some ways translating um, a type of Islam from outside, maybe to some extent engaging with popular culture, but very few are generative in the way that um, uh, the Black Muslim community and its experience has been. And, and it attracts a lot of people. The, the mosques are packed on Fridays. People love, you know, from all different communities, uh, they love, especially young people like coming in and listening to what Imam Nasser has to say. Um, so I think that's been just really remarkable. And it's kind of really an honor for us to be able to, to document that. I think that's a very important duty as, of us as academics. And we are also at FIU, which is a public university that we have a responsibility to the community that we, we're in to be able to use the resources to access the, 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 the support that we can to be able to tell these stories. We really appreciate that. So I think with that, I um, and this is gonna be a question for everybody. So anyone who wants to answer it, this is from uh, Richard Dueto. Uh, he says, as a young man, I was very ignorant to Islam as a whole. I was blessed with the opportunity to live in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, in which I was exposed to Islam and its core ideals. Particularly since my conversion to Orthodox Christianity, I've been able to draw similarities between our apostolic traditions and Islamic traditions, particularly since Orthodox Christians exist alongside Muslims in many parts of the world. I believe it's important to understand shared values with our Muslim brothers and sisters. With that being said, how do you think Muslims in contemporary American society could help bridge the gap with Christians, particularly militant evangelical Christians who do not believe Islam to be compatible with American values? I think it's probably Dr. Hameen, why don't you go first? You probably have much more experience than any of us. Okay, one of the... Um... One of the efforts that started under the leadership of Imam W.D. Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with his soul, and grant him paradise, was that we joined forces with the Focolari Movement, which is an, an organization of practicing Catholics. 
And we would do interfaith activities with them, panel discussions with them, and it was always broadcast to the public in general. Locally, our community at Master Al Alansar is involved or a part of an interfaith community called PACT, People Acting Community Together. And we do all kinds of things. Um, more recently, the Miami Day Commission voted and passed the ID um, card act that PACT was actually pushing forward. That is for people who are undocumented and they do not have IDs, this is a way for them to get IDs, uh, picture IDs, so that they can go to the doctor, so that they can do some th businesses that they, business that they need to do. Also, PACT has um, been at the forefront trying to push for affordable housing for the community in general. And each of our members who are involved with PAT serve on a subcommittee and we're very involved in that aspect. Now, as far as the militant evangelist, um, that evangelistic movement that's going on, I don't know that we'll make a difference for them. And I'm being quite honest. Sometimes people are so firm in their belief that they're not open to discussions with others. And to be quite honest, I see that movement growing among black um, Christians as well. So it's not just white Christians that are pushing this evangelistic movement militant. I don't know that the blacks are being militant, but they're really pushing the evangelistic approach to religion. I think that the more we're in the community, being part of the social issues of the community, people will take a different look at our religion. They'll have a different aspect. We also at Master at Allen Sar host um, Saturday drive-ins for food giveaways, clothing giveaways. So we have a core group of sisters and brothers in our community that do community outreach. Additionally, we have, um, we were having our Friday night fish fry, hopefully when COVID-19 is over, that will come back. That was a social, that was an outlet for the community. People who were not Muslim would come by, sit down, have fish, dinner. They would communicate with us. We would share our newspapers, share information with them, answer questions. And that's another outreach that we had going in our community. So activities like this will help to bridge the gap, but there are always going to be some that you will never reach. Thank you, Dr. Akhtar. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hameen. I appreciate that. That's I'd like great. to add one Please. thing about that question. Um, yeah, thank you for that comment. I, um, I've noticed during the interviews that, um, you know, many discussed, many of the, the, the pioneer members of the community discussed how some of their family members, you know, they, they remained Christian or their, their closest friends remained Christian. Um, did this cause any tension? Um, and the answer uniformly was that it never did. Um, it never caused any tension. Family members uh, who remained in churches understood um, the reasons for, for turning to Islam. And um, the reasons that the family members understood was because they recognized that the community of Masjid al Ansar and Islam in general shares a really core ethics with Christianity. And um, I think Master Al Ansar emphasizes ethics actually maybe more than even other mosque community other other mosques do that I've encountered, and this core ethics I think um, you know serving one's community, uh, serving one's family and and living within it well seems to have at least in practice provided a pretty effective bridge um, between members of the of the community and the Christians uh, in their in their environment. Thank you, Professor Grenier. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that was another larger question is um, uh, that, you know, you guys answered quite well, but, you know, the, the connection with, as the, con as the conversions were happening uh, in the 60s and 70s, um, how did the, um, you know, Black community, how did the, the Black Christian community then respond to that? Um, okay, so I think we have a, few questions as well. I'll turn it over to Professor Mezbahi, uh, the director of the Jaffer Center. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. <laughs> Thank you for all coming. Uh, I just had a, a couple of questions for everybody, uh, maybe uh, uh, primarily for 
uh, Abdul Halim uh, Mohsen and also um, other participants, how this intersectionality of, of the African American condition with the global struggle for justice, which has exploded. I don't know how many of you are actually watching this global development, why the, the situation of the race in this country has become almost a constant theme in outside expressions of demonstrations all over the world, not only in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa, uh, and vice versa, how the international issues that concern justice, occupation, domination, uh, racial inequality is also now is reflected in demonstrations in the United States. So I would consider that as a globalization of the African-American experience in such a way that it never existed before, actually. Um, and I think that's an important consideration for uh, not only conversation, but also to study and, and have roundtables and discussions and there's something that I think the African-American community, whether Muslim or not, they should pay a clear attention to um, and look at the potential uh, for not only paying attention to it, but also to calibrate that in terms of processing that for domestically here, but also globally in terms of connectivity with other groups and social movements around the world. So um, if you can comment on that and see how you think about that, uh, both uh, Dr. Afro and, and also Ali and, and others. Yeah, um, I guess uh, the best way I can describe it um, is that it's essentially like, I'm, I'm a firm believer in everything being cyclical. Um, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, and right now I feel like we're in a point at which um, history is sort of repeating itself. We talked about the civil rights movement. Um, we talked about um, the nation of Islam and, 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 and what they had to go through in those times. Um, right now for the African-American experience, um, we're at a point in which um, all eyes are on us more than ever, um, considering what has happened as of late leading up to this point um, and the whole fact of race in America and racism in America. Um, we, 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 we find ourselves at, at, in the spotlight and, and right now I feel it's, it's something we should utilize to our best efforts, right? Make sure we put our best foot forward, um, in regards to Islam and the black community. Um, if we continue to promote those, um, ethical qualities, um, that, uh, uh, that was mentioned earlier, uh, we, we, we will continue to bridge gaps between um, those who, who understand and those who don't, or those who are, are willing to pay attention rather um, to what, what we have going on. I feel, I feel as though the message should be, um, let's, let's take the time to really listen and discern what is being said as far as messages being put out instead of just falling for the bait every time. We live in this technological era where, you know, everything is at our fingertips, you know, with social media and TV and everything like that. And it preconditions our mind to seeing is what is seeing is believing. And that's not always the case. Sometimes we need to we need to take it back a notch and do our homework a bit and form our own consensus before just you know, going with what the public is saying, um, if that makes sense. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, we'll have our far left and our far rights, but I'm hopeful that if there are people um, involved in this, in this, in this, what I would consider a mission um, to promote uh, equality, fairness, and uh, overall moralistic value um, within society. And then just speaking from the Islamic community and African-American Islamic community for us as black Muslims to come in and to, st and to steady saying, you know, hey, um, we're here. We're gonna continue to provide uh, the information that we have been giving, which is due for oneself. And that shouldn't only just apply for the Muslim community, that should apply to everyone. 
do for yourself so therefore you can do for others make sure you you you, you promote and 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 create the best versions of yourselves so therefore the impact on your community is even greater um i think those are the the key factors and what can really turn around um american society and just in in general the world viewpoint on 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 race on on religion i feel like it's just it's just a matter of understanding that our religions like was mentioned earlier is a way that unifies people it shouldn't divide us it's a way of life um these are all things to be considered thank you I'd like to respond to that question. The Please. first thing that came up to me in my mind was critical race theory. Although most people think that the critical race theory is applicable to African Americans, it is not. Racism is racism no matter where it happens. And that's what I think we're seeing people stand up to across this global um, world. No longer do we see just African Americans fighting for their rights, fighting for their place in this world. You see it in England, you see it in Saudi Arabia, you see it everywhere. You know, critical race theory is actually an extension of the civil rights movement. And it's been renamed, tweaked, whatever you call it, but it is a civil rights movement that's going on. And when you find that the Americans, especially the Caucasian Americans who are the left or the right or whatever they call themselves are actually fighting the, the, the delivery of this information on a public forum, they're denying their history too. Because believe it or not, they may not have personally had something to do with that, but that is part of their story. And how are we going to ever change the perspective if we don't know the stories? We have benefit from learning from those stories. And I think that situation can play out anywhere in this world. Take that information, whatever that story is for those individuals, for that country, for those citizens, and talk about it openly. Find ways to do what? Move forward from it. But if you don't have that discussion, you'll never do that. And the protest is a way of what? having a discussion, bringing attention to the situation. And if you don't bring attention to the situation, you keep covering it up, hiding it, it goes nowhere. So I don't know if I answered what um, is being asked, but I that just came across my heart at the moment, that critical race theory, the pushback on it right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I mean, I appreciate that. Um, we have another question that maybe you could help us to answer. Um, it's, it, was, it was typed in. Uh, but Emilia, Emiliana Artish, um, she says, speaking to the locality of Muslim communities just mentioned, how has the Afro-Caribbean community in Miami embraced Islam and how have they changed the face of Islam in Miami? So talking specifically with the Afro-Caribbean Afro community. Well, I must say, I invite her to Masjid Al-Ansar. <laughs> and I say that because our community members are comprised of Jamaicans, Haitians, Puerto Ricans, people of all ethnicities. Believe it or not, Abdul Halim's family is what? A Jamaican ethnicity. And we're proud. We're all what? Muslim. And that's the most important thing. We don't knock each other's culture. We try to embrace it. Actually, you will find that sometimes our food is more Caribbean than it is American. And that's because that's what we want to eat that night. Sometimes we have more what? Um, food from Pakistan. We may have food from another country. But that's just the, we are a melting pot at Masjid Al-Ansar. And we love each other. We embrace each other. We don't shy away from embracing them. Abdul, maybe you can speak to that. No, definitely. I was going to chime in on that one. Um, yes, for sure. I would say uh, we are definitely a melting pot. I remember um, growing up there, uh, Sister Amina, which is uh, who's considered like our 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 
head at, at the cafeteria there, um, our head chef there, she's of Jamaican descent. So she would cook all type of meals. Um, my favorite was always the spaghetti. Uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, everything from rice and beans to uh, curry chicken sometimes, and then you have like the bean soups and the bean pies and everything like that. Um, very, very diverse culinary um, uh, exposure. And, and, and as far as, you know, the amount of different students you, you would see, um, you know, people from Saudi Arabia, you know, we have Pakistani and, 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 and and then as far as the Caribbean, some Guyanese, Trinidadian, it, it, you know, Jamaican, and then we have uh, people from different parts of Af Africa, like Ghana and Nigeria. It was it was so many different people in the community at the time, and still is. Um, that you know, when when you think of um, how it affect the Afro Caribbean community, to be honest, I didn't know anything different. Um, it was what I was brought up in. So as far as how it affected, I, I, how it affected it, I mean, it, it had to be of a positive nature because it was so many um, people from the Caribbean who who not only either converted or was already Muslim or even not and was just loving the environment and being around people who genuinely cared for each other. It was it was so much. Um, uniformity that I, I can't even really explain it. Um, but, you know, it, it, I would definitely say that Islam definitely had a huge impact on it, um, for sure. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so I think with that, I think we're nearing the end of our time. But what I would like to, uh, for each of you to do is maybe just give one to two minutes of like concluding remarks. Is there anything that you want our viewers either that are listening right now or they're going to listen to this uh, video in the future is there anything that you want to communicate about the project about your history about the community itself that you feel is important um, for them to take away so i guess we'll turn over to dr hameen if you want to go first <laughs> i'm sorry i keep calling on you <laughs> it's okay the one nugget that I would like to be sure that people understand is that Mosque, formerly Mosque 29, now Masjid al Ansar, certainly has its place in the history of Miami Dade County and the state of Florida. It is a positive impact that we have made upon our communities. Hopefully, people will see that self sufficiency was important, business enterprise was important family was important and ethics was important for our community and we lived it we breathed it and hopefully you know when we do release our project on juneteenth weekend we hope that all of you come so that you can celebrate with us in this great showing thank you thank you for inviting me to be a part of this thank you so much for being part of it um abdul halim Mosin. yes um of course, I just like to say that um, in my closing remarks, basically, once this film is done and everything is finalized um, to the viewers um, watching or in, in listeners listening in, uh, I, I pray that you all just watch this piece with an objective uh, scope. You know, don't come in thinking that you oh i've done some background research i might have some sort of idea of what i'm to, what to expect like no eliminate all that and just be a blank canvas and 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 take in what you're seeing um for what it is and then you know afterwards maybe you know come up with your own perspective or idea or, or however you want to rationalize it but what i'm saying is be unbiased and 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 welcome the idea of a new perspective that I hope that this film will provide for you all. So, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, to all the people, all parties involved, thank you for having me. And um, looking forward to uh, continuing and finishing this project. Take care, you all. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, Professor Bernier. Well. Um... I don't have too much to add. I, I would just uh, 
like to you know encourage everybody listening and and watching to um, really try to make it to our exhibit on Juneteenth, and then also you know visit the mosque at any other time, and then you can kind of see what we're talking about. I mean, you know, words only go so far um, in really showing what the place is about. Um, so I think um, you know those of you who are in Miami, um, just pay the pay the mosque a visit, uh, preferably on a Friday. And um, you'll see what we're talking about. Wonderful. Thank you all. I just want to say the final uh, uh, goodbye and also tell you that the Jafar Center will fully be behind this project and tell us whatever, whatever we can do to publicize it, to especially take it to the Muslim community beyond the African American community. Because I still really think that the, the larger um, non African American Muslim community need a lot of education about what happened here in this country, about race, about their progress, about the struggle. And the Jafar Center will be very happy to facilitate that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Iqbal, and thank you, Carlos, and thank you, Afreen, and thank you, uh, Abdul Halim. I, I gave my first talk in your mosque when I was a PhD student, ages ago. <laughs> I, was, I, I had a lot of black hair then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, one thing I just want to say before we leave, thank you for allowing us to use the method of storytelling. African Americans are known for doing what? Telling their story. And using this format allows us to do that. And that's something that you will find among us, no matter where we are, we're going to do storytelling. And I think it's important because that's part of our culture, our history as a people. So I say thank you for letting us do that. And as an edu educator, this is the best way to educate. Because the younger generation listens to stories. Yes. And it captures. So we are at your service at the Jaffer Center and FIU. Thank you very much. And thank you, Iqbal, and thank you, Carlos. Of course. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming. And with that, we conclude our session. Thank you.